Namaste. Welcome, everybody. Let's start with a short moment of centeredness in the heart. Please close your eyes. We bring the attention in the heart. in the chest area. The feeling of coming back home. in the heart. And keeping the awareness of the heart. We gently open the eyes. The same sense of presence. Me here now. What a miracle. Before starting the satsang, I want to thank the French team, thank Antonetta for the presentation. Just a brief clarification about the, the three-day retreat, which will be given at, during the time of the solstice. It will be a Hridaya, silent meditation retreat. So the curriculum will be pretty much the same as a three-day retreat, just that it will have some ingredients, this connotation of light and sun and the symbolism of light with some new teachings. But the structure will be the same of a Hridaya silent meditation retreat. This is actually what we will do, a Hridaya silent meditation retreat in this time of solstice. Acknowledging the story, sources. So we will start now this eight satsang, the eight satsang, uh, this course on self awareness, reminding you that there is nothing critical, there is nothing urgent except self awareness. The topics I'm going to speak today are in connection with the same spiritual centeredness and psychological flexibility, this bigger topic. And now I will uh, refer to doubt and the main doubt, doubting ourselves about comfort zone and centeredness. I will speak about the role of petty tyrants in our life. We will explore the question, does everything happen for a reason? And if we'll have time, we'll speak about uh, what means to have a center. 
Before this, just a brief recapitulation. In the previous satsang, we spoke about taking decisions. It's a very important topic. And essentially, we spoke about the need to get out of our limited view. It is good first to acknowledge the extremes generated in our life by our limited philosophy, point of view, education, how we go and we get attached to an extreme or another, to a yes or a no of this swing, forgetting about the center. So first we acknowledge what is not balanced in our opinions, perspectives. It's quite not so easy, quite challenging because we are so attached to them, but this would be like a work of self-awareness. It's a practice to be explored in self-awareness. It's not at all something abstract to look at our opinions and observe them and see where this extreme tendencies are going. And then we learn the art. The next step would be to learn the act of the art of remaining closer to the center, more and more to come to point to this sense of stability, to this sense of equanimity, which is a different condition. It's not the condition of the ego, but is a beautiful act of self-awareness, which can happen in our daily life as well, like now, for example. So I mentioned that a crucial attitude in our life, in our daily life, is to not be dualistic. Because this would contradict all that we are practicing, all this yoga perspective, the very essence of yoga teachings. And also in the last satsang, we spoke about how to take the opposite viewpoint deliberately and how be, instead of being lost in frustration when our values, even spiritual values are rejected, when a no is presented there in a pushy way, and how, instead of just be stuck there in frustration, to still keep the centeredness, to direct the energies, to sublimate the energies in this sense of presence, not identifying with that old pattern, but how to use that energy to reassess the being, to reassess this sense of me, not to stay in the reactive yes, no, but to awaken. This practice of sublimation is not something new or something uh, uh, impossible to do. Actually, if we look at the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the whole initiation in the five Dhyani Buddhas is exactly about this sublimating classes of uh, lower emotions and reactivities in this higher octave in this sense of centeredness ultimately as the zen master suzuki shoryu suzuki said enjoy your problems enjoy your problems now in continuation to this there was a question which was addressed uh, last satsang which i didn't have time to answer um, it was something like, like this. I, I felt uh, quite important to, to answer. Uh, what about a decision? The question went like this. Uh, what about the, the decision which may bring a lot of suffering? There are some decisions which may bring a lot of suffering. So when I'm saying that we should deeply emphasize this witness so deeply is about deciding essentially who we are before deciding what to do. This doesn't mean that we don't care about what is uh, happening or our decisions. It's just to emphasize this waking up of knowing who we are 
which is the starting base, the background on which we acknowledge and then we take this process of decision taking in a natural way. It is somehow like what uh, St. Augustine said, love and do what you like. So you can do whatever you like as long as you love. As long as you are centered, as long as you bring first the awareness to this presence, then you are free. You are free to choose whatever you feel relevant. Now, the point is that from such a position of love, for example, of centeredness, we are not acting randomly. We are not acting with hate or blindness and, and so on. Again, the limited doubting mind would say, well, but this would mean that we are not really free since we cannot do absolutely everything because when you love, you cannot really do everything. Nevertheless, the freedom of a sage is a coherent truth. We need to understand this. The, the, the freedom we are speaking about the spiritual freedom is a coherent truth, an intimate and loving vision of life, not an absurd exploration of any possibility as the doubting mind would think. No. So this freedom also, it's not rigid because in that freedom, there is also the freedom to make mistakes. Uh, Nietzsche has a very nice uh, quote about freedom. Nietzsche loved freedom so much. And he said, freedom is the will to be responsible to ourselves. Responsible to ourselves. Responsible in general means to be in charge of ourselves. And we can really be in charge with ourselves when we are aware. So again, me, here, now. What a miracle. From here, I am free to decide. Love and do what you like. So first, ask who is actually taking that decision? First, trust in yourself, in the heart. The problem is that we mostly trust in this need of taking the decision and not trust in ourselves, in that, that one, that subject who takes the decision. And this is actually the main doubt I'm going to speak now. Because this difficulty of taking decisions happens because we frequently have so many doubts, confusions, hesitations. This is um, very much what is happening in our mind. But we have doubts because we live in doubt. So once again, we have doubts because we live in doubt. It is our habit to constantly explore with our mind one option versus another because we are simply paralyzed in this more basic doubt, doubting ourselves. All this dualistic perception, all this dualistic tendency is coming from doubting ourselves. It happens so whenever we feel that somehow life is not fully flowing in us, that deeply we are not really fulfilled. There is a sense of inadequacy with ourselves, with the whole world. We feel that something is dysfunctional inside. Something is not going completely well there. Or we may feel that life is overwhelming sometimes, or often it is hard to cope with different challenges of life. 
we notice that our mind, our psyche and body are lacking a sense of balance, this sense of center. And they are not totally coherent, harmonized together. And then when the moment to take a decision comes, this inner doubt about ourselves with all these feelings inside is also there in a subtle way, haunting us. It gives us the illusion and hope that a decision regarding something outside will eventually change that uneasiness that is happening inside. So we project this inner burden and fundamental doubt about ourselves to all the choices we have to take or decisions we make. This is why, this is why the decisions we have to take seem often so difficult, so hard, so serious. And consequently, we are afraid of the responsibility of taking decisions. We don't want to take too important decisions. It's too big for us, it's too much for us. On the other hand, meditation, Hridaya meditation teaches us in a subtle way, in a gradual, intimate way, a new kind of instinct, I would say. How to synchronize our mind, psyche, and body with a silent center. This art of reorchestrating our being, this art of a sense of harmony in our being. And this then echoes in the rest of our life as well. By letting the process unfold, by trusting in ourselves, by looking for synchronicities in life, and coherence with all that is in life, the decision may unfold naturally. So it's not even a need to take a hard decision. It just comes. There are so many signs that will show us because we are present and we are open for such signs. So the only way to be totally at peace with ourselves is to open our heart. Rooted in the heart, we start to feel at ease and actually it's much more than just feeling at ease. It's about love and intimacy with the world. But the point is that in this openness of the heart, in this being rooted in the heart, we start to to feel this easiness and any choice is easy since it happens in this space of detachment and surrender, the space of the center. Then even by this very act of making choices, taking important decisions, we can still remember who we really are. So we are not just lost in that seriousness of the decision, we are the one in which that decision is taken. And also with this, maybe for the first time, we genuinely fall in love with ourselves, with life. So I invite you to a um, short meditation to understand, to, to feel this, this sense of freedom from doubting ourselves, learning to trust ourselves more. So please close your eyes, keep your back straight. Center your awareness in the heart in the chest area. A feeling of 
resting in the heart. Feel how your heart is opening. If you don't know how an open heart feels, just think about somebody you love. And allow that warmth that openness to happen. And then drop the image of that person you love and remain in just the openness. Be aware to feel a sense of balance, centeredness. This balance naturally brings, bring our energies in order. Feel this sense of being rooted in the heart. Staying in the heart. And feel how life starts flowing more easily in you. How the body and mind start functioning in harmony together. Feel what means this harmony between the body and the mind. You are relaxed at peace in the body and mind. This is 
your state now. In this state, you are not doubting yourself. You trust your heart. You feel more intimate with yourself and the world. Try to open to an unconditional inner trust. with no specific object. A trust in life, in yourself, in existence. And we gently open the eyes, keeping this awareness of the heart, this sense of balance, this simple meditation can give us a taste of how we can practice trust and freedom from doubts. Because if we want to have freedom, it's not enough to make protests and claim for it from some external authorities, but to practice it. So to practice freedom, by being self-aware, by creating these conditions of trusting ourselves. And this is valid for freedom, love, serenity. It's not about asking for uh, freedom or for love. It's about opening to it. This is what Buddha said, no one outside ourselves can rule us inwardly. So this is a very clear statement, yes? No one outside ourselves can rule us inwardly. When we know this, we become free. No one and nothing. So people or circumstances may want to do. And in extreme cases, I remember in the communist times, the, the secret services would want to convince people of their atheistic doctrine. And I remember I was in that time in, in jail because I was practicing yoga. And in spite of all that, and in spite of all the things which were happening at the surface, no one outside changed, not even a tiny bit that trust in the heart, in those values, in the, those spiritual values. If you are really trusting yourself, it's impossible. Just this brainwashing is happening only when there is not the stability in the heart. Otherwise, you cannot just shift things because 
the centeredness remains there. You can pretend or you can, but you are the same. The same center is there. Me, here, now. Now I'm going to speak about um, the comfort zone uh, and this importance of going out of this constant yes of the comfort zone while learning to keep this centeredness and not be disturbed and uh, stressed or challenged. First of all, it would be good to fully understand the difference between living in the comfort zone and being the real center, the heart. Living centered, yes? The comfort zone is a psychological state in which things feel at ease, feel familiar. It is a bubble, a kind of fairy tale uh, world in which we hope to live surrounded by all things we like, therefore, the things we usually say yes. No, we say a big yes. We accept and embrace them unconditionally. We are pretty much attached to that pleasure domain. There, we try as much as possible to exclude the world of unpleasant things. The no, the other pole of the swing of the pendulum, yes? It is a way of saying no to our insecurities, to our uh, inadequacy, uh, vulnerability, and so on. Um, this comfort zone has a big power of fascination because there we access everything we like. And thus, we often feel tempted to remain there because we are empowered at the psychological level, so at the level of personality, we are empowered by having some control and favorable conditions, inspiring conditions, good conditions, uh, at least from a physical point of view or even psychological, a positive attitude. And then we can much easily express ourselves. And all this is not bad in itself. We may want comfort, food, like uh, we, whatever this would be for us, French fries or pizza or whatever. And this is okay as long as we don't identify and get stuck in such domain of just looking for what we like in just this attachment to this yes. At least this is from the tantric perspective. That is okay. From the ascetic perspective, um, it's different because it would require to give up, to cut all your pleasures, all your attachments immediately. Um, in the tantric tradition, also you cut your attachments while still enjoying what you like. The problem is when we just get trapped in one extreme or another, of the swing. So in identification with this denial is just about denial, it's not about life, but it's about saying no to a thing, or it's just about saying yes to that thing that I like and so on. So we are getting stuck in these extremes and not understanding again this flowing of presence of the center. The need to go out of the comfort zone and now the center is coming exactly from this necessity of integrating both yes and no together. Because then, only then life is complete. Only then life is embracing all these things. While our comfort zone is just a cozy place which still remains a place of stagnation, an extreme of the swing where we are stuck 
and all such energies are like an inertial subconscious force. So they have a power there that gives power and magnitude to our ego. So this pleasant place is a place of forgetfulness. We forget how much we are doubting ourselves existentially. We forget that there are still some problems with ourselves. We try to, to forget about this. And it's a place of forgetting who we are, essentially. We can even observe that unless there is a strong vigilance, almost everybody has a constant tendency to fall into the comfort zone. Even some gurus, when they get a st certain status, tend to go there. And the problem is that there, everything we experience is about cherishing the ego. Because there, the ego is the only reference point or the main reference point, the ego. So it's about the ego. Again, who am I? To whom all these are happening in the comfort zone? To the ego. To this me, which is looking for just pleasant. The comfort zone is the paradigm of the ego is about the setting, the drama setting, putting the whole drama of the ego. There we feel good at ease, but there we cannot really be in wonderment. Real love takes us from the comfort zone in a deeper reality, which may be scary uh, and seems an uncharted territory for us it is like that total vulnerability and surrender which happens when we constantly suddenly realize me here now So if we clearly understand the difference between the comfort zone and centeredness, so this attachment to the little things we, we like and this sense of me here now, that sense of balance, when we realize this, we realize then there is a need for Big vigilance. In the beginning, it may be uh, helpful to even whisper to ourselves. So this is like a method, a very simple method, which can be very useful in the beginning. You can whisper for yourself the quiet center the still center, the love, or I am. You whisper just like this, I am. The center, the presence. in many moments of your life, in many challenging situations, I am. You come back to that. So then we realize that we don't need to, to cut or deny what we like. When, I, when we are really in the heart, in the center, uh, then by saying yes to what we like, we are not just 
expanding the ego, but we are expanding the same sense of centeredness. It's an expansion of consciousness because it's the paradigm of the I am. This is happening from that centeredness. It's not about, and we are not trying just to broaden, to expand the comfort zone. It's about broadening this sense of centeredness. So while I'm integrating the yes and no, I'm expanding the sense of centeredness, not expanding my comfort zone. I want to integrate more in my comfort zone. Then we start acting, thinking, having uh, different uh, intentions uh, from that sense of center, from this reference point of the still quiet heart, not from the cherished ego. And this brings so how can we discern? It's a matter of a unconditional honesty to reality, to ourselves. This brings, again, this sense of trust in ourselves. The beauty is that by going out from the bubble of the comfort zone, we don't need to remain in a constant challenge or stress. What used to be unfamiliar and threatening now becomes natural. Or to put it in a different way, it is as we have expanded our comfort zone, but in an absolute way, not in a personal way. Not as just the ego. We expanded the comfort zone in an absolute way, in the sense that everything and everywhere feels at home. We are at ease and in love everywhere. This is the taste and the sense of, of dealing with a comfort zone and learning how to, to navigate in this kind of challenging domain. Keeping this me here now. Let's have a moment for questions. So if there are any questions, please raise your hand. I hope now you already know how to do. It doesn't seem that uh, there are questions. Then we will go further to speak about the role of what we name the petty tyrants for our comfort zone. Now I see that there are three people who raised their hands, but I don't know, uh, maybe the French team will help me to, to deal with, uh, with this. So please allow uh, people to 
speak somehow for me doesn't uh, it's not uh, allowed to to see this hello yes Sandy. can you hear me yes hi Roger. <laughs> um so this this talk today is very relevant for me as i'm going through exactly what you are describing um and um, I'm going through this phase of, of needing to, to make some decisions. And um, I have experienced this in, in the past and it's coming back again. Um, it seems like maybe it's some kind of karma, <laughs> um, but feeling extremely anxious, extremely worried. Um, my anxiety has been unbelievably high and, and constant. Um, I try to go into Shavasana often. I try to meditate when it comes, but it just, it keeps going. Um, and I'm not really sure, you know, you're saying the, the meditation practice and, and centering in the heart will continue to kind of like dissolve this feeling of doubt and mistrust of the self. But um, I already, I consider myself to have a, a good, a good meditation practice, especially since being in quarantine, um, you know, meditating for several hours a day and reading spiritual books and lectures. I mean, it's just, it's been the main focus for me. So I don't know if I'm doing something wrong, maybe I'm meditating wrong, or I'm not really sure what, what more I, I can do to, to strengthen that, that like centering in the heart and to kind of dissolve this, this doubt and this stress because it's, um, it's quite painful. It's very, very painful, even on, on a physical level, it, it's starting to, to manifest in a painful way. Yes. The fact that is happening, even at the physical level, I know this is a kind of argument many people give, doesn't mean that is more real or more serious or more important than it is. No? So um, it's very good that you do meditation and my recommendation is to continue and continue and trust and trust in meditation and trust in this process because remember for people such periods of of difficulty and uh, anxiousness and uh, and uh, conflicts inner conflicts took months years almost the whole life so it's not just something that well, we, we learn here and uh, we just uh, uh, hear about nice concepts and then things are easy. I'm not saying this. It is a challenge in all this and we need to practice. But again, it's about emphasizing so you you ask what you are doing wrong with in meditation or if, if your meditation is not good no i'm not saying that your meditation is not good the meditation is very good but emphasize more this trust in yourself because anxiousness is actually emphasizing the trust in the ego the things may go wrong this is also a possibility some choices where cannot go the way you would hope or you would want now but if you are really center in your heart then you'll come to this intimate understanding so what so what at least i am honest with my heart I'm honest with life. I'm doing with all my honesty, I'm doing this constant practice of trusting the heart, of trusting reality, of offering myself. It's in a, a sense of surrender. And when this purity of intention is there, there is less anxiety because if your, you understand the relevance of the spiritual life, then you'll also understand the relevance of, of staying in this center, no matter 
the, the choice because the choice is just the very expression or is happening in you, in this you. It's not happening somewhere else. It's not that, oh, I am spiritual or I am present, but only as long as I have that and this and that condition satisfied. If my lover left me or if my boss is not uh, liking me or if I don't have that job or if I have less money or if I am sick, I am not in the heart anymore or I don't trust uh, God or the heart anymore. It's nothing wrong can happen. Nothing wrong can happen when you trust the heart is like going full on. It's like, you know, as the warriors would, would, would destroy the bridges behind. You trust in that oneness. And that oneness will lead you more and more to this freedom. Yes. So this should be emphasized. More trust in you. More trust in that oneness. More trust that Nothing can really um, affect you. Yes. And until, until you're saying that this may take um, a long time to, <laughs> to achieve. Um, and, and, and until then, if, if the anxiety continues for for a long time or or the indecisiveness or the doubt what's 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 the best attitude to have because i'm also yes. having a hard time accepting accepting the suffering is which adds another layer to it yes uh, it's again uh, i'm not saying it it's not even it's not even important the outcome again this is also part of this understanding is not the outcome, what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is the decision, the willingness to not accept that uh, old patterns anymore. So with my intention, I am going again and again in that trust, you know, me here now. And then the anxiety comes. But again, I'm emphasizing this. So it's not, it's not um, a state versus another state. It's with anxiety versus without anxiety. Is a process in which, yes, the anxiety used to be there. But if I look at it, it's not anxiety anymore. If I really look at it, if I really look from that me, please give it to me. <laughs> it's not any more anxiety. So the shift can happen even now. The shift can happen even now. It's not a um, definitive shift. Is not that uh, the anxiety will finish forever, but you have in the moment of being aware, you have this freedom to choose and you have this experience of being free from anxiety. And if this is happening and it's possible to happen in some moments, you trust, you start trusting. And it's a process in, in, in which you trust. You don't, you don't just go in a naive way, well, saying, um, I will, therefore, I will never be uh, uh, feeling this anxiety. It's a process of purification. But at least you understand that this is not an invincible power, this of anxiety. You bring again and again this presence. So little steps, little steps, perseverance in this trust in the heart in this presence. Yes? Yes, Andy? Thank you.
Okay. Should we go further or are there other questions? A question, how can we stay in the heart when egoic stories keep coming? It's like the pain body addiction that Tolet talks about. So how can we stay in the heart when egoic stories keep coming? It's like the pain body addiction that Eckhart Tolle talks about. Yes, this pain notion of pain body, uh, which uh, Eckhart Tolle beautifully wrote, is something that uh, many people uh, resonate with. Yes, I also feel my pain body. But I invite you to, to feel also this pandic body, this body of the heart, this body of, of trust, of of the openness of the heart. This is also present. This is also a reality of our being. And all that we are speaking about, all this movement which we are referring to, all that practice, this course, is about learning how to stay aware. How to not being taken by this pain body addiction. There is an addiction. Okay, that means that it's a repetitive power, strong power. Who am I? Who am I? It's like saying, how can you stay in the heart when you are in jail? Or how can you stay in the heart when a difficult, uh, when you are poor? Still, you can. Some people can. And the same is with this uh, emotional poverty or with this painful at the level of the soul. It's not that nobody, it's not a, a universal law that if you have a pain body, a strong pain body, uh, you need to suffer. You drop, you learn to drop that addiction to it by centering the heart. This is the way in which the transformation, the solution is. It's not an addiction to the pain body, but is a embrace and love. We can name it addiction to the spandic body, to that body of the tremor of the heart, to that body of presence. So the question continues, can we ask who is this and send love to the suffering? Yes, when we, like, when we ask like this, we realize that this essentially, ultimately, the, the pain body is not what you are. It's just a story. And then, of course, you can start sending love and compassion and sending love and compassion means what? Means that you step out. You are not that. If you are one with that pain body, you cannot send love because you are just identified with that. No? Maybe a sense of pity, poor me, but love happens when you have that zooming out, that recollection of yourself in which you see yes there is the pain body there are many things in my soul many 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 things but i am not any of them i am something that embraces all of them and this trust brings so much freedom and and power to go beyond all this yes So I feel easily pulled into the ego surrounding me, but I will stay grounded and enjoy spanda and connectedness. Yes, this is the way. This is the way. There is no other way. So let's go further. Yes. Now I'm going to speak about the role of petty tyrants for 
our control comfort zone. So how to get out of the comfort zone by using the petty tyrants. So first of all, what are these petty tyrants? A tyrant, as you know, is a person who is using the power or control in a cruel or capricious way. And we have countless examples like this in the history of humanity. Now, the notion of petty tyrants applies to those kind of bully people we meet in our life who tend to intimidate or persecute us, at least in a restriction uh, significance of the petty tyrants, because we will see there are others way, other ways of looking at it as well. So, but first let's look these petty tyrants as those people we feel uncomfortable with. Um, again, before going further, as an echo of what I already said in connection with the questions which we, we had, it is important to observe that what we are studying here, taking the opposite viewpoint deliberately. So just what happened or what we studied in the previous satsang, as well as welcoming the petty tyrants, welcoming, not being afraid, but welcoming the petty tyrants in our life. So all this means not allowing life to be as usual, just a place of reactivity in which things happen to us, just happen to us and we suffer the consequences, but a kind of continuous new experiential place of investigation and learning. So when what is happening in our life is not just, you know, complaining and that, oh, I'm feeling anxious about this and that, but it's like, I observe these things are really problematic, but I observe them. It's a place of investigation, a place of learning when we are willingly open to meet adversities in life, an important step in waking up happens to us because we are not anymore in fight with the world, in fight with ourselves, but in a conscious exploration. Adversities are not problems anymore, but they point and help us to come closer to ourselves. Therefore, the idea is that we are not trying to just offer some solutions on how to deal with that specific challenge or anxiety or so-called adversities in life. It's not about offering a specific solution. We just learn new, I would say, paralogical strategies. So those kind of strategies that embrace the yes and no together, not being afraid or not having this sense of anxiety when uh, no is there. So embracing, we learn a new strategy. As Nisargadatta Maharaj said, no, try the other way. Don't go just in pleasure and running for pleasure and running from pain. Try the other way, detach from all this, go to that level where the I am is continuously present. So it's a different strategy. And we are learning through different uh, specific examples, we are learning about this new strategy. We are learning how to explore consciously these aspects of life, how to bring new fascinating perspectives in our understanding. And
In this way, the world becomes, as I said, a continuous exploration. We find out that all these problems, tendencies can point to self-awareness. They are good. Many times people said um, there is a need for suffering in order to awaken. Even you mentioned Eckhart Tolle. Even Eckhart Tolle uh, had this, at least for him, the experience was like this. It's not always like this. For me, it was not so. I cannot say that uh, out of a lot of suffering, this uh, awakening uh, happened. But I totally honor this intensity of pain. And I realize the, the, the tremendous power which is there. And we can learn to consciously embrace, even if our life is, is, is apparently very, very good. You know? By bringing the attention to, to places where challenges are or suffering is, we can embrace this, but not being lost in that. And then we keep this centeredness, whispering, I am. Centeredness, no, coming back. So the understanding of this aspect is very important, not trying to find solution to your problem, but trying to find a new way of seeing life. Otherwise, we will act from the same old perspective of the samsara, of victims, egos, looking for some miraculous solution or having the need for a protection there. It's not from that place of the ego that the anguish or anxiety will, will uh, be free, is freed. It's not from that doubting point place. First, we need to change inside. First, we need to be rooted in the heart, to trust ourselves. And then this new way of seeing happens. So in life, we need the challenging powers for bringing maturity and ripe our trust in ourselves, which will change gradually our behaviors. So this insightful notion of a petty tyrant was brought uh, by Carlos Castaneda in many books. One of them is The Fire from Within. Um, it's actually a part of the teachings which his master, Don Juan, gave. And um, he was praising this role of the petty tyrants and the importance of, of them. When uh, Castaneda argued uh, following the common mentality that tyrants can only make uh, their victims helpless or um, tend to make the victims as brutal as the tyrants would be. So just following the same bitterness in life, Don Juan responded, the difference is in something you just said. They are victims, not warriors. So, our choice is always, do we react as victims or respond as spiritual warriors? Of course, the use of this notion of a warrior is just a metaphor, it's metaphoric. This is not about a common fight, it's not even about a need to control, but about awareness, centeredness. As a victim, we go further into the swing. Yes? As a victim, we go to that pole of fear, doubts, stress, attachments, on the other part, to what we like, the, the grasping, the needs, and we go in this swing. Sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like that. This is what is happening as a victim. As a conscious being, we come constantly towards this, the center. So I'm not saying that 
we are staying only in the center because this may seem difficult or too much for us. But it's like about the vector, the tendency. I am going towards periphery. I am going towards these extremes, towards these attachments in my life, in what I'm doing now, with what I'm choosing now. I am going closer to the centerness, to this peace of presence, or to the alienation to the periphery of the veils of, of me, to the doubts, to the fears, where I'm going, with all I'm, that I'm doing. So this is also something very important to understand. It's not about just being lost in anguish or being as the ultimate uh, reality, a realized being. It's about where you choose to go. Patanjali expressed this in a very systematic and clear way. It's a viutana, he named it, a tendency towards externalization or a tendency towards centeredness, niroda, dissolution, pure presence. And essentially everything is reduced to this. Either we go into externalization, you know, agitation, doing things and believing in, in that like, dislike, or as Patanjali said, niroda, which means a sense of dissolution, a sense of peace that comes in the center. A tendency, again, not necessarily the absolute. Today I meditated. Today I brought my purity of intention. And I know deep in my heart, I know that I am honest with myself. I know that I am going towards that sense of presence. I am not taking just that passive role of the victim. Yes. So a petty tyrant has power upon us because we accept it. So it's important to understand this through our fears or sense of defeat. We are empowering such people or even such events as that appear to us as a tyranny in our life. This obsession with the pain body or this, it's like a petty tyrant for us. No? On the other hand, there is a beautiful uh, story in the Buddhist tradition. It is said that uh, once a cruel general was uh, conquering the, the country and um, he used to burn and kill people. So when he entered a village already, all the people from the village ran, except for the priest, the, the monk who was living in the, in the monastery there, in the, Zen monastery. So that general came with his army on horses in that sacred place. The monk was just meditating. He was not scared. That intrigued greatly the, the man because he said, how do you dare to stay in meditation and not kneel in front of me? Do you know who I am? I am the one who can behead you without blinking. To this, the monk smiled and answered, and I am the one who can be beheaded without blinking. To behead somebody without blinking is easy. It's just this cruel attitude of a, of a normal, uh, tough warrior who is just used with this closeness of the heart. It's just the expression of that extreme. Many people come to this condition. But to be able to be beheaded without blinking is the expression of that absolute condition of 
centeredness. You are at peace. Not even in this terrifying situation. Of course, this is an extreme story, but this shows how a petty tyrant or a big tyrant you know, can have an impact upon us or not. And we can learn from this story and we can learn to apply with people who are appearing to us as petty tyrants. So to empower something or somebody means essentially to allow that person or that situation to become a center for us. No, it's there we are identified or we believe that is the center. That is a reference point for us. Along with that fear, it's a center of power. Yes. And in meditation, we can observe how obsessive thoughts, painful bad bodily sensations or memories become our petty tyrants. We identify with them, with such memories or regrets and so on, and accept their tyranny because it seems that we don't know another way. It seems the only way. I just get that memory or I am struggle with that, that, that regret that is haunting me and I don't know other way. And this is exactly what we learn in Sri Daya meditation, to be a witness, to come in the center and from there the catharsis, the purification is happening only from there, only from that stability. But this, this constant tyrants, this is happening not only in meditation, but also in our whole life. Believing and accepting that imposed power upon us bring a lack of balance in us, takes us from the real center. But self-awareness, this centeredness in the heart gives us the trust and there is the other way which initially we didn't know. In this self-inquiry is the other way, is the middle path Buddha was speaking about. Indeed, we can extend the concept of petty tyrants to anything and anybody that stresses us. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, for example, when fear was so big, I repeated again and again, be part of the solution not of the problem. To be part of the problem means to be the victim, to be so much afraid, to be, to, to be taken by that fear, to be part of the solution means to go consciously in the direction of self-awareness. Again, I'm not saying that you need to be the realized being, but you go into that direction of the trust. It's a craziness in the world. Things are changing. We don't know what will happen. Who am I? I'm coming to that. I'm not just lost in all that. So taking the victim role, everything or almost everything can become for us a petty tyrant. So it's about taking, not playing the victim role. The, when you play the victim role, you are just playing. But unfortunately, we are taking this role and we totally identify. It's not a playing. We are not, even if ultimately is a playing, it's a play. We are totally identify and we are totally believing that this is real. This is totally real. So when we take such a victim role and we live with this philosophy in our life, Almost everything can become a petty tyrant or more and more things, even our cat. No, uh, my cat can become my petty tyrant because why? Because he's asking for food, he's waking me up in the morning, he's meowing too much, it's like this or like that. So something that can be so sweet and so nice can become, you know, somebody or something that is threatening me. 
again, we need to understand very clearly what I'm speaking about. What means to go consciously in that direction of the center, in spite of the adversities. This means to emphasize the present moment, to start appreciating and loving this sense of balance we were meditating upon earlier, this sense of the center, not the story. Of course, this doesn't mean that we ignore or repress the circumstances. It simply means that we are embracing it. We are embracing it as a fact from this self-awareness, not from the ego perspective. In this, the story is stripped from all the struggle, problems, drama, personal interpretations, reactivity. And there is a need for training in this. We can take it as an ongoing experiment. So I can even ask you and start by asking you, what is really stressing you? Even a tiny kind of stress. It can be, you know, ridiculous. Like I said, oh, my cat is doing this. Or I feel stressed uh, when I need to give a lecture or I need to write something or I need to uh, clean the dishes. Washing the dishes is uh, like a tyrant a petty tyrant for me, a little one. But there is a contraction somehow there. And then, especially with these tiny little things, you can realize the, the, they are petty. They are not really powerful. You start with these really little things, and then you see how a shift of attitude, when you just observe, it's not about pushing, oh, I need to love washing dishes if I don't, uh, I didn't like this uh, all my life. But I just observe. What is this reaction in me? What this makes me to react and to have an aggression about uh, uh, this, you know, or not uh, using the vacuum cleaner? There was a joke about what are the uh, common points between men and uh, dogs. And it was one of them, I remember, was that both are scared of vacuum cleaners. No? So you observe all this and look at them. And this way of smiling, this way of, of looking at it with detachment is in itself a way of, of freeing because we, we are not able to really get out because we are not yet able to observe. When we observe, we already make this step. There is less identification. So there is a need for a training in this. It's a training and we can take it as an ongoing experiment in our life. Please take it as an ongoing experiment with our life. Being able to, to make such a sort of scientific experiment with our psyche. And this means to be freed from the narrative, from the dream in which we are lost, the things are like this, or I, hate, this is how I am, I hate uh, washing dishes, or I cannot uh, uh, do this, or it's too much for me, and so on. So we just observe. It's like a scientific experiment. It's not just scientific, actually, because such exploration always involves love. It's a sense of love there. It's not just a rational 
um, mental approach is a love presence in all these experiments that we do. So the suggestion coming to the petty tyrants again, the sol suggestion, uh, the solution suggested by uh, Don Juan was to smile, to smile at petty tyrants. They just said, as Shunryu Suzuki, enjoy your problems. So Don Juan said, with that moment of awareness, so again, with that moment of awareness, warriors can honor, can honor the stress the petty tyrant provides and remain curious to learning. Remain curious to learning. They can be thankful for how lucky they are to have petty tyrants in their lives. We should be thankful for such a perspective which uh, Don Juan offers to us. It's like opening our eyes to a different approach to be thankful for those, how lucky we are that we have such challenging people in our uh, life. But when this thankfulness is ha happening, when this smile is happening, of course the old charming power is which they used to have is not there. They are not taking our power. They, it's not a struggle anymore. We are already in that zooming out, that recollection of ourselves. Um, Charles Chaplin used to say, to say, the life seen in zooming in is a tragedy. In a zooming out is a comedy. It's a beautiful way of saying, indeed, when we just focus and we are lost in our ego story there, everything seems like a tragedy. In a zooming out, starts looking like a comedy indeed. Or at least we are not fighting the situation anymore. We are observing with awareness what is happening. The situation, the play of emotions, the unpleasant sensations that are coming, everything. Chogyan Trungpa, this great uh, Tibetan master, said that the role of a guru is to insult you. So the role of the guru is to insult you, uh, which maybe seem a little bit too strong, but is exactly about this taking us out from our routines, agenda, imagination, uh, dogmas, programs, beliefs. Otherwise, we still stay in the comfort zone. Otherwise, we still remain. It's even in spirituality, a kind of spiritual comfort zone or of, or, of a comfort zone of spirituality. When we go, people and listen to, to teachers who are saying exactly what we already know. And we are just saying, yes, yes, I know. Yes, oh, yes, it's true. Any challenging idea, we don't want to accept. This is too much, it's too strong. Or uh, how he dares to speak like this. He just uh, uh, told me that I'm selfish. Oh, how he dares. Uh, this means that he's taking my, my power and so on. No, it's not taking my power. It's just an invitation to observe myself. Maybe indeed I acted in a selfish way. I'm grateful. I observed. And if that statement is true, I'm very grateful. No? So even though my Romanian yoga master was not a realized being, 
I'm very grateful because he fulfilled his role of crashing egos very, very well, very well. He was doing this, knew to do this uh, very well. Um, Gurdjieff, uh, great master, Sufi master, or inspired from the Sufi tradition, who sometimes was named the rascal sage, simply because he was pushing a lot uh, people, um, had also in his sangha or spiritual community in uh, France, such a person who was not uh, uh, having a, a spiritual calling, who was constantly a troublemaking person, who was constantly aggressing others, um, but this very difficult person was somehow kept by Gurdjieff there as a good ingredient. When the community managed to kick him out and he left uh, very unhappy of what happened there, Gurdjieff went to him and he even paid the trade ticket to come back <laughs> there. So understanding the, the, the importance of such a person uh, in a community. And I can say that we kind of have such a person in Longeval, a person who is a quite good master there in triggering and, and pushing the comfort zone of others. Uh, for uh, Socrates also, uh, Xantipa, his wife, was an example of a petty tyrant, uh, example renowned in the whole ancient uh, times. Uh, and this again was a constant training for him, um, being taken constantly from the comfort zone, from this land of yes and little pleasures. Because life in its majesty is not so. Uh, the story is that uh, Santipa was constantly yelling and, and being very aggressive. And once uh, uh, when somebody uh, visited, when uh, Socrates invited uh, him for the dinner. So imagine, you know, uh, the man, the master comes and invites uh, somebody to the dinner and the wife would nicely prepare the dinner and uh, fulfill, you know, the, the care of being a good, uh, welcoming person. But no, Santipa turned the, the table upside down and start screaming and making a, a big mess there. So this is uh, another way in which Socrates, in his wisdom, was training himself. And again, I'm giving you a beautiful quote of uh, Shunryu Suzuki, this great Zen master. He said, when the restrictions you have do not limit you, this is what we mean by practice. So when the restrictions you have do not limit you, this is what we mean by practice. So when we see that that restriction, that contraction that you have when you are uh, washing dishes is not there, when your cat is not seen as a tyrant anymore, it's like, you know, embracing different domains of life and realizing it's not just, you know, uh, step by step, but is also about understanding a different strategy is like, yes, you make some steps and you realize, yeah, it is possible. And then more and more, you embrace the whole world. And then how cannot be freedom? No, how can be anxiety anymore? When you consciously 
went in in embracing and training 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 in this accepting and embracing petty tyrants and this will make us to be free from doubting because otherwise we we doubt maybe here it's it's too much but then i i see it's not too much to see my cat not as a tyrant because it's asking for food and meowing no actually i see and i love and i'm grateful that uh, she is as the way it is yes the way she is so integrating more and more more and more is just this freedom so let's do a meditation a short meditation in which we can learn how these adversities can teach us these petty tyrants or adversities difficulties in life uh, can be embraced when we learn to open our heart so just please close your eyes keep your back straight relaxation We bring the awareness in the heart, in the middle of the chest, a little to the right. And keeping the awareness of the heart. We evoke the image of a person we really love. Thus, we start how our heart, we start seeing how our heart becomes more and more open. Allowing this sense of balance, flow, harmony. Between body, mind, and all aspects of our being happen. may experience a sense of warmth, tenderness, honesty in our heart.
and we are very aware of what is there. Now, we evoke the image of a person we don't like, a petty tyrant. Of somebody who created some wounds that are still open in us. We are equally present, aware of all what is happening in our heart. It may be pain or contraction. also try to witness in full equanimity all these sensations Now, we again bring the image of the person we love. Feeling again A sense of release, openness, the warmth in the heart that it brings. Now, while we keep the image of the person with love, that sense of openness, we bring also the image of that person we don't like or even of that situation that usually tends to create a contraction but now we keep we consciously keep the heart open
try to prevent the reactive closure. We enjoy the openness, even if a sense of pain may still be there. We enjoy the openness. Thus, we learn how we can be in the presence of difficulties or petty tyrants while still keeping the heart wide open. We can gently open the eyes This is exactly the attitude we are referring to, this proper attitude of centeredness, from which we will learn the freedom of witnessing in self-awareness. So the problem, ultimately, the problem is not we realize that the problem with this pain is not the presence of that situation or that pres or that person, but the closeness of the heart. What really hurts is this closure. Because when we close, there is this sense of alienation and separation and pain. But if we would learn how to keep the heart open, exactly as we keep the heart open when we are in the presence of somebody we love, to keep the heart open in spite of that adversity, a big part, a big, big part, the main part of that issue is taken away. Because even if, even still we, we feel the, the, the pain or the, the, the wound, we are open. That means we are present. That means this is happening not to an ego, not to a story, but to this loving presence that we are. And there is an infinite trust, an infinite power. So keeping the heart open is the best indication of being really present, really awake. And exactly as we train our muscles in order to have an harmonious and functional physical body, we need to train this kind of sui generis subtle muscle of the heart in order to stay with the heart open and embrace the petty tyrants with the heart open. There will be, you know, the smiling, there will be this, uh, it's a genuine smile. It's a genuine gratitude because we are not the victim anymore. Because we just had an opportunity to be present, to see life not just from our tiny perspective, but from a wider one in the 
ancient Chinese tradition related to the itching with a book of changes. You know, it's this book of changes, uh, which appears more as an oracle for from an external point of view in this itching or itching. Um, the word success. So for them, the word success was represented by an image from nature. So success was an image from nature. And it was explained like this. The clouds pass and the rain does it work, its work. So the clouds pass and the rain does its work and all individual beings flow into their forms. So the contemplation of these natural events points to the way to success, which lies in this honoring, understanding and honoring Tao, which is the way of the cosmos, is the way of zooming out, the way of the center. Things are coming, the clouds are passing, the rain does it works, everything flows in its forms. Honoring this sacredness, honoring the flow, not the tiny drama we are identifying with. We will uh, conclude now. Um, I will um, conclude with a quote we used to, to have a nice poem or quote in the end. Now a quote of uh, Dalai Lama in the tune of what we said. He affirmed, don't believe that some kind of blessing from outside can change your life. That is totally wrong. Buddha make it very clear. You are your own master. Your future entirely depends on yourself. But of course, not you as an ego, but you as that openness of the heart. You as that longing to the center. Let's um, share each other and flow in this meeting together. So please, uh, let's turn on the videos and have a moment of being together.
Hmm. Hmm. 